Another senator steps down and is public safety at risk because of budget cuts. We discuss in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Minneapolis firefighters testified at the Capitol on what they believe are the effects of cuts to local government aid, citing lower staffing levels, lower response time to emergencies, and other concerns. They say public safety is suffering, as evidenced by a recent church fire in Minneapolis. Yes, was I involved in a dangerous incident? Was the staffing levels at the Walker Fire, I can't tie that into whether I was hurt or not or put me in danger or not. But what I can say is that the job that we are doing in the city right now, we're doing it with less firefighters. We are doing it with, uh, we're doing tasks that are meant for a four person engine crew and we're doing it with three. Usually on a fire alarm, there are two engines, one truck and a chief. That's 11 people. So we responded with three rather than 11. I can't, just like Joe, I can't predict how things would have gone if we would have had more people, but I know that the ladder crew would have been in there with us, helping to break down the doors, make access to the attic, carry in the tools, help us lay the line, and do all the things that we usually do. There are some things that just don't get better when you get leaner. That's fire and police. What suffers is our response times, the service we bring to the citizens. Now, I can't say would somebody, had they lived, if we'd been there quicker, had we not. But you know what, if you have a relative or a loved one in front of you, full arrest, heart stopped, do you want us there in three minutes, 39 seconds, or do you just want us there in five and a half minutes with, you know, with the three people instead of the four? I know that there's money issues. I mean, it's, it's all over the nation. And um, people are asked to do more with less. but. In my opinion, our, our job is different. Um, we really can't do more with less. We do less with less because even if fires go down, you need the same amount of people on the fire ground to operate safely and effectively. This is not a city of Minneapolis problem. It's not a state of Minnesota problem. It is a United States of America problem that uh, we are seeing budget cuts uh, trickling down and seemingly only to affect personnel at the local level. The price of government, what we're spending on public services across the board has gone down dramatically <coughs> in recent years. There's no runaway spending going on in Minnesota. That's false. But what we have done is we've delivered tremendous tax benefit and tax breaks and tax cuts to the wealthiest in this state over and over and over again while we shortchange fundamental core services and we ask those who are least able to pay to pay more and more and more. At the same time, we've seen income stratification, the kind that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. We're seeing a middle class that's just being hollowed out. Senator Patricia torres Ray hosted the hearing that discussed some of the impacts of LGA cuts to the Minneapolis Fire Department. She's here now to talk a little bit about that hearing and some of the broader impacts of LGA. Senator, thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Let's begin with the hearing that again, you just hosted and essentially the testimony from several of the firefighters, they were all in favor of not cutting LGA and of properly staffing fire and rescue. So. For you, what was the impetus for even calling this hearing and what conclusion, if any, did you come to by the end of it? Well, um, really my intent here was to try to educate the public about what government constitutes, what is government, and at the end of the day, how uh, cuts to government impact people's lives in a very direct way. And so um, this incident uh, was really an incident that uh, I think was a, a presented an opportunity for me. The incident to, being, meaning the fire? The fire at the Walker uh, Church, and uh, in which uh, seven firefighters uh, were injured. And uh, there are, you know, there are several things that can be said about that particular incident. But the conclusion is that very definitely the uh, firefighters uh, felt that they were understaffed 
and that the situation got out of hand uh, because they did not have uh, enough people to respond. And so I think that uh, people in the public really need to understand what that means and why these budgets have been cut and why the cities, uh, the, the, particular, the city of Minneapolis in particular, my city, is having to respond the way they are responding. And this is happening everywhere. And I think this is just the beginning. Uh, clearly, you know, my city is one of the largest cities uh, in the state of Minnesota. So uh, we, you know, we, that's where things happen first when it comes to cuts to the schools, to uh, you know, all multi hospitals and programs uh, where you have a larger volume of people is where you really begin to, to really look at uh, the consequences. And I think that was a, really a good opportunity for me to show the public what this is. And generally speaking, people in all forms of government agencies, public safety included, they're essentially being asked to do more with less. And during this hearing, Jerry White, who's one of the Minneapolis firefighters, he stated that public safety should not be held to the do more with less standard. So in this era, Senator, of streamlining and hold all, holding all agencies and departments essentially accountable for their budgets, would you say that public safety should be held to that standard? Or do you think that, that again, as the testifier said, it should not be held to the do more with less standard? Absolutely not. It should be. Uh you know, we're beginning this conversation right now. I think these incidents are serving, as I said, as an opportunity to really look at how we fund local communities and local programs. Uh, there are certain things that, in my view, uh, we definitely, and in the view of the public and every constituent that you ask, that we should fund. You know, nobody should be uh, put into a situation where, you know, you call because there is a fire in your house and people will say, well, you know, I mean, your city did not receive proper funding, so we don't have firefighters available to you. Or, you know, if somebody uh, calls for an emergency call, call 911, you cannot tell a person that is dying, well, your city did not receive property uh, 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 enough, you know, uh, funding for LGA, therefore we don't have a person available to you. Uh, it's, it's a human right is uh, really a right uh, that uh, individuals who live in the wealthiest nation of this planet are entitled to. So today we're asking the question, are we uh, using our political campaigns, our political views uh, to really reduce that access to that right? I believe that that is wrong. I believe that we do continue to live in the wealthiest nation of this planet. And you have seen the, you know, the profits of uh, larger corporations, people who are making a lot of money, the 1% who's making a lot of money, and the 90, 99%, which my constituents who are firefighters were victims of, who are not you know, able to perform their job and may lose their lives. I think that is really a contrast that we need to see and that we're living every day in our country today and it's unfair. So today, I think as uh, elected officials, we're called to figure out how do we resolve that problem for our constituents. So giving uh, local aid to the cities to struggle to figure out who do they fund, the hospital, you know, the, the, the firefighters, uh, the police station, how do we use the money that, you know, is so uh, restricted uh, that we don't have enough. Maybe we need to think about probably, you know, the firefighters said that we probably have to give, uh, allocate funding for those specific programs and a formula base so that every city will have enough resources to respond. Well, maybe we have to do that so we truly see what is the cost of government and the responsibility that the state has towards, uh, you know, people uh, in general, not just people who have money, who live in areas where they can pay high property taxes. So. Um, you know, do a person in a diner is more entitled to that, uh, receive that uh, service uh, in a proper way than a person who lives in a small city in rural Minnesota? The answer is no. I'd like to get your thoughts on a comment that was in a MinPost article on January 10th. Co-chair of the LGA study group, Representative Linda Runbeck stated, I see LGA has been a crutch and, and all it's done is make it easy to increase expenditures when they can. Do you think there's some validity to that statement? I do not. I do not, and and this is why you know if 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 we need to review the formula today and we need to figure out that indeed that is a crutch because you know the cities are being funded properly and and they are receiving, uh, well let's figure out really who who has enough money to respond, uh, you know to public safety calls. 
I don't think that there is. And, and you know, the intent here was kind of to serve as that crutch for the, for the cities that do not have enough revenue, for the cities that do not have the affluent families, the, you know, the larger homes that can pay these kind of uh, property taxes that are necessary uh, to, to, you know, to, to function. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really, so it was, it was to balance really the lifestyle of those individuals who live in affluent communities versus that, those that don't. That is what has been really the history of this state, and we need to maintain that. Well, if people argue, you know, that those cities uh, that have low-income families, low-income individuals that have small homes are really receiving too much, well, uh, let's do a state, you know, appropriation, and let's give them those uh, uh, direct appropriations, that, that revenue directly to them so that they can provide services directly to their constituents. So Senator, my last question for you then is we do speak with Senator Roger Chamberlain. He'll be on a bit later in the program, but he said essentially this working group, the first thing that they've had to do is try to come to a, an agreement on what what constitutes a need versus mm -hmm. say a want. Mm -hmm. What would you say qualifies as a need? Well, that has been, you know, the history of this funding, um, uh, really trying to define what need actually is. And I think that we need to move on beyond that need into a service. When you really define, when you call and a person needs to receive a response to the 911 call, do we call that a need? <laughs> that is a, a response that a city has an obligation to respond to. That has a cost, and whether we, we put that at a higher value because it's in a city that is a larger city where you have, you know, have a need for uh, more individuals to respond because of the distance, uh, distances or whatever it is, maybe you can work out a formula for the cost of the response and for the cost of that service that you have to provide. But, so, so I think from a, a kind of a, a perspective of mathematical perspective it is easy to say you know how many residents what is really the need in terms of services that you need to provide to those residents and what is the cost in that locality to respond well that's what it is provided it seems to me that we're moving into a situation where we need to the state needs to provide that direct payment for that service that is provided and that service cannot be different as I said, it cannot be different in Edina, in Rochester, in Homestead. You know, it cannot be different. It has to be the same service because it's the same individual with the same right. And so I don't think that calculating that is very difficult. I think that politics is what is complicating this equation here. It is politics. It is our lack of accountability towards our constituents and deciding that there are some people in the state of Minnesota who have enough money to pay and have the means to pay for that individual that has not, that does not have the resources. So the person that has the affluent home does not have a greater right than the individual that's, that, that doesn't have the resources. They have an equal right and we just need to calculate it. Okay, I don't Senator, think it's that complicated. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for bringing the conversation to the Capitol Report set. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. The Local Government Aid Study Commission was established in 2008, but in reality it had its second meeting the beginning of this year. The co-chair of that study commission, Senator Roger Chamberlain, joins me now to talk a little bit about where they are right now. Senator, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Good to be here. So that is my first question. Again, the um, LGA study group established in 2008 really just kind of got its work started, although the deadline is this December. So where are you? And how quickly do you have to get things going to meet, to meet that deadline? We are, we have decided uh, to uh, refocus the efforts on redefining need. Uh, since the early 70s, the, the scope, uh, the breadth and depth of this program has expanded tremendously uh, to, uh, to include many things other than need. We've gone beyond need. And everybody on the commission uh, agrees that there has to be uh, some clear understanding of need. Trouble is that you have uh, maybe 12, 15 people on the committee and 
need is, has a different definition with all of them. So our, our hope is to redefine need and establish a simpler formula once and for all. For 20 some years they've been working on talking about establishing simpler formulas and getting back to need. So we hope to, that is our goal, to uh, redefine the need and uh, establish a, a simpler formula. Okay, um, an argument was recently made in a hearing here at the Capitol that LGA cuts have had a direct impact to the response time, low staffing levels, and overall safety issues within the Minneapolis Fire Department. Other cities have similar concerns, so in your opinion, do cuts to LGA equal public safety concerns? Uh, simply, no. Uh, half the cities and towns in this state do were not receive any LGA. They have a very good public safety service. They're adequately funded. Uh, LGA was initially, second LGA was initially established for those cities that were truly suffering that, you know, had very, very low uh, uh, commercial industrial base, property tax base. So you could supplement that so they could have roads and police coverage. Well, uh, many, you could argue Minneapolis uh, uh, has, has a big property tax base. They have sales taxes much higher than most uh, across the country. So they, for, if they are suffering, <laughs> suffering in that area, um, uh, Mr. Ryback is responsible for that piece of it. The primary function of government, one of the primary functions is public safety. So if that's not his top, top role in the, in the city, I don't know what it is. He has made public statements saying that that uh, uh, his city is in excellent financial condition. He's told me privately he's in excellent financial condition. Well, apparently he's missing something because if he's in excellent financial condition, he's ignoring the his fire department. So. Some of the things that have come from these mm -hmm. LGA cuts throughout the years have been um, a little more innovation within how cities operate. There have been some shared services, just some some ways to streamline. And right. so. Given this idea, one of the firefighters last week, Jerry White, testified mm -hmm. in the hearing that public safety should not be held to the do more with less standard. What do you think? We have not, the state is, uh, has very little role in funding public safety at the local level. In the, in the, uh, with the exception of those towns and cities that truly are, lack a commercial industrial base. Minneapolis does not lack a commercial industrial base. The city of Minneapolis is responsible for providing that fire and safety um, uh, funding and training. We have a, we have a, <coughs> a fee program that uh, we charge a fee on insurance, uh, homeowners, uh, homeowner insurance for uh, fire, uh, fire training. That's still there. They're getting ample funding that has not been uh, reduced. So um, the, we do not subject the, our, our public safety budget last year was held harmless. It even increased a little bit. So we are not playing games, political games, with, uh, with the public safety because we and I recognize clearly that public safety is one of the primary goals of government and we are not cutting corrections, we didn't cut police and fire, we didn't reduce those fees. Uh, it's a primary function of the city. Minneapolis has ample resources and need to focus on it. Senator, you're, uh, the commission co-chair, Representative Linda Runbeck, stated mm -hmm. in a MinPost article on January 10th, mm -hmm. quote, <coughs> I just see LGA has been a crutch, and all it's done is to make it easier to increase expenditures when they can. Would you concur? I would concur because uh, I think we could all agree that if you give some a dollar, someone a dollar or a thousand dollars, they now understand that they have a funding source, a revenue stream, and they're not likely to give it up uh, too easily. So once it's there, it's, it allows them to free up other dollars to do other things. Now I believe LGA is a necessary thing for some cities and towns, but we have to be very careful in how we uh, allocate those dollars and where we put them. If, we, uh, if we're not, it just allows cities and towns to use money to do other things that they don't need to do or shouldn't be doing. Again, half the cities and towns don't get any of this stuff. Most of the cities and uh, towns I represent get nothing, and they have a great uh, public service system. So uh, this idea that Minneapolis and St. Paul and these large class one cities uh, somehow are suffering, I'd, I'd say take a look at your, uh, your priorities. So what's next for the commission in trying to establish and trying to meet this December deadline? Well, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, but uh, uh, so I don't, don't know what they established or what they're looking at, but we still had to decide what the formula is gonna be and what need is. Uh, there's a need for some LGA for some places. Uh, we spend, uh, I think the payout now is held flat at 2010 levels. 
It's about uh, $430 million. And uh, the bottom line is that the state does not have limitless resources. The taxpayers in the state do not have limitless resources. The demographics are changing and we need to be use the taxpayers' money effectively and efficiently to provide practical smart government. And what we've been doing for 40 years with LGA uh, is simply uh, time to review it and uh, establish some clear criteria for what it is. The taxpayers in the state can no longer afford to do this uh, without limit. Okay, Senator, Senator Roger Chamberlain, thank you for those words. We'll follow the commission, of course, and we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. The Senate Rules Committee continues to meet on the issue of paying attorney fees for a case involving a former Senate staffer. Some members continue to express concern over the unknown costs. I'm troubled uh, obligating the taxpayer for something that really is internal. I'm not asking the Republican Senate caucus to pay this bill. I'm just saying I think uh, I, I think you should, being in the majority, you should pursue the idea of a legal defense fund. This could be a lot of money and a long time. And I don't have an interest in settling this out of court. I don't think the Senate did anything wrong. But the cost of defending ourselves, who knows where this is going. We need to really focus on the, on, on the bill. It's... Uh, well, from the standpoint of Senator, 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 reasonable I, and necessary, we, we, we're my, maybe getting at the edge of well, my of point Senate strategy. My point is, I don't think I should. I, I had, and my caucus members had no responsibility for the situation that we're in, and I don't feel an obligation to have to vote yes on this. And I think, uh, I don't think people should dismiss the idea of setting up a legal defense fund so taxpayers do not have to pay for this. He's chaired the Local Government and Elections Committee since 2011, but Senator Ray Vandeveer has opted to not seek a third term in the Senate. We sit down with him to get the inside perspective on his legislative career. Senator, you decided recently to not seek re-election. What was the impetus for your decision? Well, my health. It, it's, uh, the, the job is fun and it's exciting and I love doing it, but it's also exhausting and it requires that you be uh, really on the ball all the time and I felt like I was not in a position to do that for another four years and plus my family was you know they're very involved in the campaign they'd walk on nails to see me get reelected but I didn't want to put them through that for you know another year so I just decided it was time the challenges of my health mainly so Okay, well, you did serve six years in the House, eight in the Senate. So looking back on your career in the legislature, what would you consider some of your most important or fun work? Well, fun uh, highlights, I probably passed 50 or 60 bills in omnibuses and stuff. But um, a lot of times you get stuff done without doing that, like uh, the boom site in Stillwater, they were closing that uh, as part of uh, shutting down rest sites. and but this was a beautiful piece of property along the river and, and uh, so we were able to put pressure on the department to open it back up and take care of it. They did, a, did that with uh, DNR so that was kind of a highlight. Another one was uh, <clears throat> I'm very concerned about property rights and, and there was a veterans rest camp, disabled veterans rest camp in the district I represent and they ran into some difficulties. They were put in, delineated inside a regional park and they couldn't even get permits to do uh, a handicapped bathroom at a disabled vet's camp. So at that point we decided to take them out and we did. Had a lot of bipartisan support for that. That was probably one of my favorite memories is, is doing that bill because uh, you know the people we were serving and the people that the vet's camp serves. And so it, and it was just like uh, just like uh, walking through the Capitol with a little kid, everybody wanted to pick up that bill and help with it. It was very bipartisan and, and uh, passed overwhelmingly to protect the camp and and then protect them from eminent domain and also to uh, allow them to run themselves and exempt them from property tax. And Senator, in your other life, you're a real estate appraiser. So mm -hmm. having been in office during the housing crisis, and some contend it's not over yet. I know we've had you on the Capitol re Report set plenty in the last four years to talk about housing issues. How did you use your knowledge of the industry to facilitate legislation? Well, we 
<clears throat> we would attend. I did author once the uh, advocates bill asked me to do it for affordable housing, and we allowed them to uh, find ways to keep it permanent after they've actually done it after they've developed some property and and so we worked on that and found agreement with uh, developers and builders and all those worked on that but um, I think uh, regulation is is a real big issue with local governmental uh, activity in housing is a big deal I mean whether we decide to subsidize it or what they allow it to be built so we're not supposed to get off on too, too many issues here but Although you're not technically going to be a member of the legislature when the, when it con reconvenes or convenes, excuse me, in January, do you see yourself taking a lot of what you learned here and bringing it back to your your private life now, it, to your work life, and perhaps trying to tighten up some of those regulations that way? Um, potentially, I think what you learn here mostly is relationships and and how to deal with other people. I think is a value that you walk out of out of the legislature with because that's what it's all about. If you can't work with some people, you can't get things done. If you have to agree 100% on everything. Um, but So what are you going to miss the most when you step away? Um, I think being able to, one of the things that you do that isn't legislation, it isn't the bills you pass all the time, but it's being able to help people. Someone will call up and they have nowhere else to turn. And sometimes you can help and sometimes you can't, but it's amazing what a call from a senator will do surprises me even today uh, what it can do to kind of shed light on things and get things moving that might not otherwise move. So the ability to help people that really have nowhere else to turn, that's some, one of the most exciting parts of the job. What's next for Senator Ray Vandeveer? Uh, spend time with my family, which has been a challenge the last 14 years, and uh, probably work on my business some more, the real estate appraisal business, a little bit in real estate, but uh, mostly slow down a little bit. Senator, there's going to be a very different legislature next session. Do you have any advice for the new members? My advice to new members is, you know, keep your mouth shut, pick your enemies later, not at first, and get along with as many people as you can. But still know the listen, learn, and remember the four words, I can't do that. <laughs> so. Senator, here's your chance to speak to your constituents. What would you like to say to them? I would like to say thank you. It was really a privilege. I, very few people get to do this, and and uh, I just really enjoyed it. And I think they place a lot of trust and confidence in you when they let you come down here. And uh, they've been very respectful, very, uh, very, uh, how do you put it, gracious and easy to work with, and just not a lot of conflicts. They're always respectful, and I just want to thank them. All right, Senator Ray Vandeveer, thank you so much for your time and your perspective. Certainly. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching this week's Capitol Report. <laughs>